was called the Auction Lunch Saloon. And in those days, saloons offered free spreads during lunch hour for the people who came in and drank. Yeah. Well, around the corner was the mining exchange. And this was the first stock exchange on the West Coast, and it was created to buy and sell shares in the Comstock Lowe's. Okay. Now, the agents in the mining exchange used to have lunch at the auction saloon. And when they were there, Flood and O'Brien were able to overhear hot tips. So it was sort of a primitive form of insider trading going on. Huh? Right, there was no SEC in those days. So through those hot tips, they were able to buy and sell shares and make themselves a tidy profit. Now with that nest egg, they partnered with two mining engineers up at the Comstock Lode in Nevada, John McKay and James Fair. Fair and McKay were drilling down in two mines that were thought to be tapped out. But they started running into veins, so they notified Flood and O'Brien, who bought up shares in these two mines, which at the time were selling for just pennies. Well, several weeks later, McKay and Fair hit what was to become known as the Big Bonanza. And this was the biggest mining strike in history. As a matter of fact, it was a 54-foot wide and 400-foot deep block of almost pure silver ore. Whoa, that's amazing. Yeah, and pretty soon, these four guys were each raking in about a half a million dollars a month. So, with that newfound wealth, Flood began building things all over San Francisco. And then later on, of course, his son built this building. And he didn't spare any expense in doing so. Look at this beautiful marble on the floors and on the walls. And with these great glass doors for the offices, I feel like I'm in a Dashiell Hammett novel. Well, as a matter of fact, Dashiell Hammett worked here. In this very building? That's right. He worked here as a private investigator before he went on to write detective novels, The Maltese Falcon and The Thin Man and The Big Knockover. God, another bit of great San Francisco history. Right here. Yeah. One of the great things about this building is it's still owned by the same Flood family. As a matter of fact, I'd like to introduce you to the great-grandson of James C. Flood. Oh, that's neat. Hi, Jim. Good to see you. Well, it's good to see you again, Dan. I want to introduce you to a buddy of mine. This is Greg Sherwood. Greg, right. how, how are you? you doing? Great. We just had a great time looking through the building, and I just want to thank you and your family for doing such an outstanding job making this such a wonderful representation of San Francisco's early years. You guys have done phenomenal work keeping it in rather pristine condition. Well, thank you. We, we, we tried hard. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Let me just show you a little bit on okay. this photograph here of what we did in 1992. We replaced these uh, four arches that were badly destroyed by Woolworth when they were here for 40 years. And we replaced them. Uh, coming up the picture a bit here, the balconies and balustrades were falling down. Uh, the outside of the building was badly spalling, so we replaced a great deal of it, restored the building back to the way it originally was in 1904, at least tried to. And we think it turned out quite well. It's not easy keeping history alive, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Dan, ever since I was a kid, Lotta's Fountain has sort of intrigued me, stuck here right in the center of downtown San Francisco, and yet it's so out of time, out of space, so reminiscent of a, of a different world. I know there's great stories surrounding it. Well, that's because this fountain is the last remaining remnant of downtown San Francisco when it was a Victorian wonderland. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this is the oldest city monument in San Francisco. I didn't know that. Yeah, it was donated to the city in 1875 by Lotta Crabtree, who was one of the most famous and successful entertainers of her day. The most important thing about this monument, though, is that it really represents the spirit of San Francisco's rebirth following the 1906 earthquake and fire. And to understand that, first of all, you have to understand the magnitude of that event. The 1906 earthquake and fire was the worst natural disaster to ever befall an American city. There were over four square miles of the center of the city completely destroyed. Half the city was left homeless, about 250,000 people. 
So the city was in chaos and confusion. People had been pushed asunder. They didn't know where their friends and relatives were. And this monument actually became uh, spontaneously a central meeting place where people gathered together to pull their lives back together. And it must have been sort of heartrending some of the scenes here of families reuniting for the first time, friends reconnecting and realizing that they had survived, they had made it through. Yeah, it must have been incredibly emotional. This was a real beacon of hope in those days. Now, the job of cleaning up afterwards was a very daunting task. There were over four billion bricks spread throughout the streets of San Francisco. And it took an entire year just to clean up the debris. But amazingly, by 1910, the city had substantially rebuilt itself. Now, it was in 1910 that this monument also became a focus point again for San Francisco. The story actually begins in New York City when Luisa Tetrazzini, the most famous Italian opera diva of her day, became embroiled in a battle. A promoter there had booked her for a concert, but she said, no, my manager says I must sing in San Francisco. Well, a court battle ensued, and during that time, she exclaimed to the press, I will sing in San Francisco if I have to sing there in the streets, for I know the streets of San Francisco are free. Well, she won her court case, and headed to San Francisco. And the citizens here followed the progress of her journey all the way across the country. It was sort of marvelous to having this world-famous person coming to our town. Oh, yeah, people were very excited. And when she arrived here, Greg, she made good on her promise. And on Christmas Eve, 1910, 200,000 people filled Market Street, surrounded the fountain. When she stepped up onto that stage, the crowd just roared with approval. But when she began singing, even people at the very back of the crowd were held spellbound. Now, at the end of her final song, on her final note, she soared to the top of her register and held that final note for one long, transcendent moment. And it was then that San Franciscans found tears just streaming down their faces. And it was such a, a welling up of emotion for the collective realization that they had finally made it through San Francisco's darkest hour. It was sort of like going through a dark tunnel and finally coming into the light and seeing a new San Francisco rebuilt, re-energized, and reborn. And when she finished her recital, they just enveloped her with wave after wave of applause. And it was later that she was quoted as saying, I love San Francisco better than any place in the world. San Francisco is my country. Well, yeah, I got to tell you, Dan, those of us that are born and raised here, I bet you many of us uh, would uh, share that sentiment with Madame Tetrazzini.